in true Harvard fashion. I think we're starting at 8 after. Uh, but welcome to the Harvard Graduate School of Education for our master class today. For those I do not know, my name is Bridget Terry Long. I'm the academic dean and Sarah's professor of uh, education and economics here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So welcome. Uh, I have the pleasure of getting to introduce our teacher today, our expert teacher, uh, Dan Levy. Uh, Dan is the senior lecturer in, in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. I first got to know him because of his research. Uh, which focuses on social programs and de mostly developing countries. So just to give you a flavor, his recent work includes an impact evaluation of girl-friendly school construction programs in Africa, an examination of conditional cash transfer programs in Jamaica, and providing technical assistance to Mexico's social development ministry. However, we're not here to talk about his research. We're here to see his excellent craft uh, as a teacher. Uh, he teaches courses in quantitative methods and program evaluation, and he also serves as faculty co-chair of a week-long executive education program titled Using Evidence to Improve Policy and Programs. And notably, uh, he's also the faculty chair of uh, the SLATE initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School, and SLATE stands for Strengthening Learning and Teaching Excellence, and so hopefully we'll have a chance to ask him a bit about that during the discussion section. Uh, he has been recognized for his dedication and expertise as a teacher, and in 2004, he won the Carbello, Carballo Award, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, which is the teaching award at the Harvard Kennedy School. It recognizes a faculty member's dedication to students and excellence in the professional field and commitment to public service. There's, in fact, a 2012 article in the student newspaper of the Kennedy School that describes how much his students appreciate him. It says, on the final day of classes in December, uh, the students, about 60 so students in the class during the last 15 minutes, and a touching show of gratitude for their teacher's obvious passion for teaching and commitment to their learning, one by one the students stood up, flipping their name cards to reveal, thank you, Dan Levy, and sharing out loud a brief thought on what his teaching had meant to each one of them. There were not many dry eyes in the class that day. <laughs> So if that gives you some perspective. Uh, Dan's talk today is called uh, Making Learning Memorable. And for those of you who have not taken part in a master class here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, there will first be a demonstration part of about 40 minutes. And it's intended to be an authentic experience, learning experience in a classroom. So thank you for all of you who have already filled out your, your name cards as requested. Uh, and then there will be a, a reflection part. Uh, during which I will be moderating, and I'll kick off with a few questions asking Dan to share a little bit about his approach and his assumptions and intention um, as he's been putting together this lesson and what he's been doing, and we'll open it up for your questions as well. So thank you once again, and welcome. Um, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm uh, truly honored uh, to be here. Teaching is one of my lifelong passions. Uh, the experience of helping another human being learn is one that I find profoundly... You need the microphone. <laughs> it's one that I find profoundly stimulating rewarding and fulfilling both intellectually and emotionally. So being here today to share with you what I've learned at the Kennedy School in the last 10 or so years of teaching is a real treat, even though a little bit terrifying, um, given that most of you are here because you're interested in the craft of teaching. As honored as I am to be here, I know that I wouldn't be here if we were not for the help of many people who have helped me improve in my teaching during the years. So I want to take a moment to thank a few of them that have had particular impact on this class that you're going to experience uh, today. Um, first, my colleagues uh, at the Kennedy School, both faculty colleagues and uh, teaching fellows, who have helped me teach this material over the years, in particular John Friedman, Eric Mulliger, Kerry Nelson, and Deb hughes Hallett, and Josh Yardley, who's here uh, as a teaching fellow a few years um, ago. Uh, second, I want to thank my teaching gurus over the year, those who have mentored me in particular, Alison Pingree, Josh Booking, and Lee Warren, who have coached me through 
both good and bad times, and there have been a lot of the latter ones. Um, third, I want to thank my students, uh, some of whom are here, and whose learning is what this is all about. Uh, it's not about what I do in the classroom. They are the ultimate judges of whether anything that I do inside or outside the classroom works or not. And then fourth, I want to thank the two people who have had the most direct impact on the class you're about to experience today. And they are sitting there, uh, May Klinger, who works for Slate and is a student here at the Graduate School of Education, and Teddy Sorono, who's a PhD student and has had incredible influence on my teaching. So if I may, I would like to ask you to please join me in thanking uh, them. <laughs> So um, before we start the actual class, I thought I would tell you a little bit about my approach to teaching and how it relates to the title of the uh, class. So when I design a course, or more generally a learning experience, I think about what are the three to five concepts, ideas that I want my students to be able to master at the end of the course. And the education lingo, even though I discovered this name many years after I started practicing, is called backward design. I assume most of you are familiar with this. And the analogy that I use with students uh, when I talk about this is I tell them, I want these concepts and ideas to be so much in your bones that you remember them five years from now when I see you at an airport. And so <laughs> the, uh, the airport becomes a shorthand way of referring to those key concepts and ideas that I feel are very important. So what I try to do is to make the learning of those concepts and ideas memorable, and hence the title of this uh, class. And I do that for two reasons. First, because these concepts are so important, we try to refer to them at various points in the semester as a class, and so I want to have a common experience to which to refer, a shorthand way to refer to that experience. And second, hopefully by making that learning more memorable, they're more likely to remember five years from that moment when I see them at an airport. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to pretend you are my students for the next 35 minutes, and I'm going to try to teach two of these airport concepts. This is not exactly how we teach them in a regular class, and this is something that perhaps we can come back in the debrief. So the flow of this class might not be ideal from that standpoint, but I hope it will provide us with a common experience with which to then have a debrief, which uh, in my mind is the most important part of this conversation. So let's begin with our two airport concepts. So the first uh, airport concept or idea is illustrated through a puzzle that might seem trivial at first, but I think reflects important ideas in the studying of probability and statistics, which is the general realm uh, of this uh, class. So um, I'm going to give you a puzzle, and in a second I'm going to ask you to register your answers with these devices. And the puzzle is the following. You meet 20 unrelated people. And the question is, what is the probability, what are the chances that two or more people share the same birthday? Now, for those who are very into, OK, exactly what are the assumptions that I must make, I'm going to give you the three assumptions. But I don't need you to do exact calculations. I just want you to answer roughly what you think that probability is. So when I say the same birthday, I mean people must share the same day and month, not necessarily the same year. I assume, or we should assume, that each birthday is equally likely, and February 29 counts as March 1st. That's sort of in case you're, I'm sure some people are wondering, well, what about my birthday? So, uh, so I want you to write, you have a, a little handout here, which is a guide, but more than writing, um, I want you to uh, please vote when you have a chance in terms of what you think. And I think most of you have used this, but just press the letter that corresponds to your answer. And if you change your mind, you can press 
your second answer again, only the last one will count. So you can't vote twice. And um, it, okay, so we're about fifty some people in the room. Let's see. Oh, like most more people came in. Um, and so I'm going to reveal the answers now. And we have roughly two most about forty two percent think less than five percent and about 29% think um, more than 40%. So those are sort of the extremes. So uh, what I'm going to ask you is to do something that I might regret for the rest of this conversation, <laughs> which is um, to actually fill in a survey with your electronic device. I'm going to ask you to do that and then put away your electronic device. And I hope you follow that last instruction. So if, uh, if you can go to this site, you will be asked to answer two questions. If you don't have an electronic device, a smartphone, anything web enabled, if you don't have one, uh, please raise your hand and we have a backup paper survey uh, to uh, complete. So please raise your hand if you don't have an iPhone or Android or some device where you can fill in this. <coughs> So I'm at the point where I cannot distinguish whether you have finished, whether you haven't finished the survey or whether you have finished but are taking the extra seconds to check your email. But I'm going <laughs> to assume it's the latter. And so, um, OK. So let's, um, let's first try to see what probability can teach us about how we calculate uh, this number. And so we want the probability that at least two or more people share a birthday. And um, it turns out that it's easier to calculate the complement of that probability, which is uh, the probability that no one shares a birthday. And so that's what we're going to do now. And I'm gonna, we're going to focus on this probability here. And so I'm going to um, ask maybe one of you So here's a calendar. I'm going to ask one of you, Felipe, when is your birthday? June 14th. June 14th. OK. So Felipe is going to be the first of our 20 people. Here's his birthday, June 14th. Now let's start this problem with thinking that we only have two people rather than 20. So say Felipe is June 14th, and now Bobby comes into the room and we're trying to figure out what are the chances that she does not share a birthday with Felipe. Can anyone tell us? Um, I know most of you are not familiar with my teaching, but I don't tend to ask rhetorical questions. I'm actually asking, <laughs> hoping that someone could help us here. Rui? Nobody. Nobody? Well, yeah, but so Bobby comes here. And 
we want to know what are the chances that Bobby's birthday, Nick? Uh, 364 to 365. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nick is a student, former student in the class, so I'm very happy to hear him say this. <laughs> 364 over 365, right? Because the only date in which they would have common birthdays would be June 14th. Now, suppose if instead of having two people, we had three people. Now, what do we think is the birthday? There's a probability that the three people would have different birthdays. Maybe I want to ask someone. Since I don't know most of you, I'm going to ask my friend Andrew. Who <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, who teaches this? I have a plan. All right, I am glad to ask, ask anyone else if you want to tell me. I'm going to go. I'm going to try it. Joe. It's 364 over 365 times 363 over 365. Thank you very much. 364 over 365. This is two people, but then the third person is 363 over 365. Right? And so you can do this on and on. And so for 20 people, it would be 364 over 365 times 363 over 365, and so on, up to 346, sorry, 346 over 365. And so let's see what that results in. So when we do that, what we get is 0.41. That is, there's a 41% chance that in a group of 20, two or more people share a birthday. And I want you to start thinking about the 71% of you who did not get this answer. I want you to start thinking about why you think your answer was different, particularly if you voted that it was less than 5%, I want you to start thinking why your answer was different. But before we do that, while you're thinking, there were 20, there was 29% of people who actually got the right answer, which was above 40%. So the first thing I want to do is ask them to please stand up. <laughs> One, 29%. All right, so the first thing we're going to do, no, 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 keep standing up, please. No. First thing we're going to do is, is a round of applause for them. <laughs> wait, 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 don't sit down yet. Don't sit down. Now I'm going to ask you, and only those of you who are standing up, to please answer honestly and candidly the following question. <laughs> With your clickers, please. Uh -oh. <laughs> so A is yes and B is no. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Do you mean in advance of your presentation? That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's what you are saying. 60% of you knew this puzzle from before. So even though 29% of you, you can sit down now, sorry. <laughs> Even though 29% of you got it right, most of you knew this puzzle from before. And this puzzle, by the way, fools most of people who are seeing it for the first time. So I want to devote a few minutes to ask the question, why is it that our intuition is so far off when we say less than 1% or less than 5%? So I want to open it up for a conversation. Kathleen. Um, practical experience. I think okay. of being in a class in elementary school of 30 people and no one had my birthday. So I hear 40 and I think, hmm, doesn't seem very likely. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. Notice I, I want you to hear well what Kathleen just said. Practical experience that in a class of 30, no one had what? My my birthday, she said. My birthday. Is that the same question we were answering here? Right? So what Kathleen was doing 
is what a lot of people have studied, which is to substitute a difficult question, which is the one we just saw, for an easier question, which is the one she answered. When I was in my class, no one had my birthday. But the real test in her class would have been to see whether any of her students were sharing birthday, not just whether they were sharing with her. And in fact, the probability that in a group of 20, they would share a birthday with Kathleen is actually pretty low, close to 5%. But that's different from the probability that any two people in that class or more share a birthday. This phenomenon of substituting a difficult question for an easier one is one that has been studied by many people, one of them, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics a few years ago, even though he's a psychologist. And it's one that I think we do all the time. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples and ask you to reflect in your own life whether you ever do this, because I suggest you, you might. So surveys sometimes want to ask uh, people how happy they are. And they typically do so by saying, how happy are you these days? Now, that is a very complex question to answer. How happy? Well, what does happiness mean? What does these days mean? You know, is, is happiness what we're all about? And then you, sort of your brain can go there. <laughs> and so most people instead answer, what kind of a mood am I right now? So that's sort of research on happiness. Or if you're in an airport and you get asked, have your bags been with you at all times since you passed? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that question? I mean, most of us, that's a very complex question, right? So cognitively, okay, when did I pack? Okay, I left the bag here. What happened? Oh, yeah, I went to dinner. Was my bag alone? Was at home? But, and so instead, what do we do? We answer a much simpler question, right? We answer the question of uh, maybe did I pack my bags? That's easy, that's yes. By the way, if you've ever uh, gotten that question, um, if you answer no, I have actually, uh, the personnel usually doesn't know what to do with that answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a warning. They have like a decision tree and the branch no, no, of no sorry. hasn't been written yet. <laughs> and so, uh, it's just, uh, okay, so, um, I am curious because when I've done this in my classroom, most people, but by a larger margin who get this puzzle right, actually knew about this puzzle. We had the same phenomenon here, but not as extreme. So I'm going to ask one of those who answered this question correctly and did not know the puzzle before if they can share the reasoning with us just so that we have um, point of view, and the reasoning cannot be, I'm very smart, and hence I got the answer. <laughs> so can I get, so 42, all right, Luis. Um, I saw that the other uh, amounts that you put from answer A to D were too small uh -huh. in terms of percentage average. Yeah. And the other thing is about the coincidence of friends in Facebook, it's quite large. Coincidence of friends in Facebook. Steps, okay. So that, like, you see people when you open your so when you open your Facebook account, it's like, oh, these two people have a birthday today or something. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, I guess first idea is be careful with your intuition in terms of trying to assess odds, because there's a lot of research that we are not very good. Luis accepted at doing this, um, <laughs> uh, at doing this. Um, and in particular, if we were in an actual course, I would tell you this is the whole reason you're taking a course on probability and statistics, but this is probably the last time you're going to be in a classroom about this and you're going to leave away, so I'm not going to make that argument. So <clears throat> I want to close this airport idea uh, with just suggesting that in a uh, in a group uh, of, we, we just did this for a group of 20, it's 41%. A group of 25, it's 57%. So if you're at 23, you're already passing the benchmark of 50-50. And uh, I think we were about 50 or 60. So it's virtually certain that in this classroom, we have uh, a common birthday. 
And in fact, the reason we asked you to fill in the survey is to assess whether that happened. And so Teddy, who's the wizard at lots of things, <laughs> is telling us, I hope you haven't left the room already, but if you uh, were born in July 17, can you please stand up? There it is. <laughs> if you were born in October, on October 11, can you please stand up? <laughs> By the way, this forces you to wish each other happy birthday. <laughs> and if you were born on October 8, can you please stand up? <laughs> All right. So uh, this was not just guru statistics. This was actually confirmed uh, by this. And so now we're going to move to a second example in which I hope uh, the relevance of it will become a little clearer uh, than just whether we're good or not at estimating odds. And this has to do with medical testing. Uh, Felipe, you want to ask us a question? Yes. You want to ask us a question or you want to challenge us here? No, no, no. I okay. am going to ask you a question. Yeah. So um, you have to point to the data here about yeah. the question that you asked. You asked, you had the data of how many people were choosing uh, answer E. Yeah. And then you have the data when you say, please, those who have answered right, stand up yeah. and answer the second question. How is the mismatch between the first question and the second one? Oh, um, you mean that there are some that people... someone says, yes, I got it right, and that person didn't. And that person? Didn't get it right. Oh, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I was counting on everyone being honest here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I... I uh, we, I will only say that uh, we tend to remember or not remember things that are to our convenience, but I'm counting on everyone being completely honest uh, here. There's uh, certainly a lot of research on recall bias. It's usually because people, like I think there was some study done where uh, people were asked who they had voted for, and that suggested that Kennedy had won 93% of the vote. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, and so I don't, uh, the short answer is I don't, I don't know. Uh, most of the time, at least when I've done this in my classes, the percentage of people who's, who got it right and then say uh, that they knew the puzzle is above 80%. It was a little bit smaller, but still significant. So thank you. All right, so this second uh, airport concept is one that occurs. So I want you to imagine any time you go to a doctor or to a clinic, for a medical test, and I hope that this will help you um, the next time you go to a doctor, although it might get you in a little bit of trouble with your doctor uh, when, you, um, when you know this. Oh, I'm going to... So there's a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of uh, attention in the press with uh, medical testing, and in particular, uh, several, these are several headlines from the New York Times recently uh, that suggest uh, at least some confusion in terms of what medical tests tell us or not. So here's one title, How to Measure Medical Treatment Potential for Harm. A lot of attention with mammograms recently. I don't know if some of you have read some of the articles recently, but uh, from a public health and a public policy perspective, a lot of questions about whether we should have universal mammograms. So here's an article, universal mammograms show we don't understand risk. Should I have a mammogram or not? For women, a more complicated choice on mammograms. So a lot, and mammograms, by the way, is just the, the thing that has been most in the news um, lately, but we're gonna talk about medical testing in general. And so I'm gonna ask you again uh, a question. Uh, this uh, hopefully is not as much of a guess as before. And the question is a prototypical question that you might have to face when you go for a medical test. So a medical test is developed to assess whether a person has a certain rare disease. The test is pretty accurate, but it's not perfect in the sense that everyone who has a disease gets a positive test result. Positive meaning the test is suggesting that the person has a disease. 
and 90% of those who do not have the disease get a negative test result. So in that way, the test is, that's the accuracy of the test. Those are the two statistics that you need. <coughs> so we have a random person that gets tested and receives a positive test result. And the question is, and, and just, I, I want you to literally, I mean, I don't want you to imagine this because no one wants to get a positive test result, but just imagine a situation where a person gets a positive test result. And the question, a randomly chosen person, and the question is, what are the chances that this person has the disease? So I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit on it and then vote when you're ready. If you don't remember the problem, the handout has all the details in case you want to look at it. question about the question, not about the answer, <laughs> feel free to voice it now. Okay, so um, with your permission, I'm going to view this results in private. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to ask you to get together in groups of three or four to discuss your answers and try to convince each other. I want you to um, use the back part of your handout to draw or illustrate in whatever way you can, and then we'll come back five minutes from now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. All right, so we have a we have a very interesting result <laughs> which is the number of I don't know actually <laughs> went up. Which is, uh, my friends who teach ethics tell me, in an ethics course, that is actually a good sign. In a statistics <laughs> course, it might not be. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, let's try to explore this uh, together. Anyone uh, who wants to uh, tell us their reasoning, in particular, if you change your mind after the conversation, if you can tell us why, what led you to that. Um, I know, well, let me be clear then. If you change your vote, because I know votes change, I don't know if minds change during the last time. <laughs> Joe, you were doing a lot of graphics here. Can right. you tell us like, how you were reasoning? Sure, although I should say that the fact that you called me means with confidence, by confidence, the answer is now very low. Okay. Um, but what I, what I imagined was two circles of 100 people each, just to make it simple. Joe, so do, you, have it uh, do you mind if we put this there so they oh, can see what you, my elegant, uh, your elegant diagram? Okay. Thank you very much. So the um, big circle on the left is those who receive a positive result. And inside it is a smaller circle of 100 people who really do have, have it. And then the uh, central region is the 10% of the uh, 100 who don't really have it, who, but who got a positive result. So I figured, okay, so there's 110 reports of positive finding, but only 100 who really have it. So that's 100 over 110 is 91%. That was one way I thought about the answer. The other way I thought about the answer was the way I solved the birthday problem, which was to guess that it was a trick problem and it didn't <laughs> <laughs> Normally, my students figure that out by the third class, not by the first class. <laughs> okay, and so you now think that because I only asked three questions, that must not be it. Uh, no, I figured that you're not going to do suckers in the same way twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone wants to tell us what you think about Joe's reasoning, whether you agree or not, your reasons for it? Yes? Um, pay, pay? Well, I actually did it exactly the same. <laughs> pointed out to me that um, the, the uh, prompt actually specifies that it's a rare disease okay. and that in the 100-100 scenario it's a 50% occurrence rate for this particular population and that, that probably doesn't really constitute a rare disease. And so we did add a couple of more examples where it was a lower occurrence rate and discovered that the probability would, would, would probably be less than 90%. Um, it sounds like he changed both your vote and your mind. <laughs> Anyone? Joe, you want to respond to him? Yeah, I'm sitting next to Terry next time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that usually helps. <laughs> Anyone else wants to weigh in here? Yes? Hi. Uh, so initially I did get primed by the, the quality of the test, so yeah. to speak. That when you have it, you, you have it, and so I go C. Yeah. Uh, but then when I started thinking about it, the priming was the wrong prime. I should have been thinking about uh, the fact that it's actually very rare. Yeah. And that it's more likely that it will give a positive result when it's negative. In one sense, like, sorry, that may not be the right way to say it, but it's more likely that I don't have the disease, even if it is positive. Uh. So, um, we're bumping against the time limits. In the interest of time, I'm just going to try to summarize some of the uh, exchange here, uh, which was very uh, good. Um, in, in case you're curious about um, what the last vote was, um, 40, sorry. So 
to 45% of you voted don't know. Uh, I take that as a sign that doing all of this in 40 minutes was delusional and ambitious on my part. Okay. So, uh, and, and this picks up on Pei Pei's and, um, and, and Terry's sort of argument. Um, say we have a thousand people. And the, the key thing here is, as Pei Pei was mentioning, is that this is a fairly rare disease. I'm going to choose arbitrarily now that it's 2%. We can change that number. But if it's 2%, these are the people who have the disease. And because the test is perfect for them, then all of them are going to be reported to be positive. And so the true positives, that is the ones who are correctly identified as having the disease, are 20 people. Now, the remaining 980 people, the test is pretty good, but 10% of the time it fails which means that 98, 98 of those people will be reported positives as well. So Joe's reasoning was right. He was trying to compare right, the people who, who tested pos the true positives and the false positives. The initial assumption of 50-50, the 100 and 100, was the problematic one. So if, if you think about this, then all we know is that the blue ones are not. The blue ones tested negative. So all we know is that if someone tested positive, it must have come from either the orange group or from the red group. And just visually, I hope you can see that these two groups, you're much more likely to come from the orange group, that is the false positives, than from the red group, the true positives. So in other words, if you, if you, if you uh, do it in terms of odds, the probability of being sick, given that you tested positive, is the true positive divided over all the positives, both true and false positives, which in this case is 20 over 118, which is 18.5%. So much, much lower than 90%. Much, much lower. Now, I, I want you to notice one thing that's very important here. This person when they went to the doctor to get the medical testing, the chances of them having the disease was 2%. Now the chances have gone up considerably. Now they're 18. But it's still much more likely that they don't have the disease than they have it at this point in time. They can do further testing and so on. The reason this is so important is if you think about a policy like universal mammograms, what you have to remember is that if these were the numbers for the mammograms, this would mean that out of every 100 women who go and get a positive result, assuming you know, this is truly universal, you know, 81 of them, of those who get the test, a positive result, will get informed that they have the disease when they don't. And that has cost for society. I'm not so I just want to be clear, I'm not suggesting here you shouldn't get a mammogram or anything like that. I don't want any liability on this. Uh, I am suggesting that you be careful with uh, interpreting the test. And the reason I suggest you be careful is that there have been plenty of studies suggesting that doctors themselves don't understand this. And when they report to you, they sort of see you got a positive results, and they look at that 90% and they say, well, you know, it's very likely you have the disease. So they confuse, in other words, they confuse the probability that you're after, which is the relevant one. So I'm, I'm just going to close here with a couple of uh, comments, and I wish we had time for a little bit more discussion. But here's what the doctors confuse. The doctors confuse the probability that you have the disease given you get a positive result, which is what you are interested in. What we know is you got a positive result. So the doctor should tell you, okay, given you got a positive result, this is the probability you have the disease. But what the doctors have, the information they have available, is the probability that given you have a disease, you tested positive. So the doctor might report to you a much higher number than is warranted.
All right, so because I want to make sure we've got enough time, I'm going to close uh, here with uh, some meta lessons. This, by the way, uh, is one of the most fundamental theorems in statistics. It's called the Bayes rule. It's spawned a whole branch of statistics. Um, and we saw a um, gentle introduction to Bayes rule, or I hope it was gentle. Uh, and. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, who we mentioned in the first part, has written a lot about how people get these kinds of things wrong uh, for the same kinds of reasons uh, than before. So I'm going to close here by just telling you, in case you're wondering, that I have met students at an airport. Here's one picture of them. Uh, and hopefully, if you learn one thing in this class is that that is not as unlikely as it might be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Fantastic, amazing, wonderful. And so uh, we're going to transition here. I have a million and one questions. I'll try to keep them short because I'm sure you have questions as, as well. Do you want to sit? you want to stand? Whatever you want. You take the lead. Oh. You go. You tell me. All right, well, I guess we're... You're the academic dean, so... <laughs> I like to stand. Okay. Sitting all day. Um, where do I begin? Oh, my goodness. So, hopefully everyone really enjoyed that. Uh, Dan actually gave me a question that I could start him off with, because there's so much I'm sure that he, he could cover. But I'm curious, you know, first of all, how did this lecture compare to what we would see in your regular class? Yeah. Like after we... So, uh... I think several uh, things. One, the most important one, is I didn't know who was going to be here. And so I knew nothing about you. I knew nothing about your statistical background. And I therefore could, had a lot of difficulties planning a class that would uh, fit with your background and level. Uh, when I teach a typical class, I know lots of things about the students, not only in terms of what program and what background they have, but lately I've been working on uh, having online modules that some people in this room have actually been instrumental in developing, uh, where students do this before class. And not only do I have information about the students, their background, all of that, but I have information about what are the areas of the class we're going to see where they might have pitfalls. So, if we had done this for this class, I would have known that 29% of you didn't know the answer to the first question, and that might have affected my choice of having, instead of two examples today, I would have done one. Thanks to Bridget, I moved from three to two, but now I <laughs> wish I had moved from two to one. Uh, so, so that's one difference. Two, uh, because my students, uh, some of which are here, come uh, with what I thought uh, would be a higher technical background, I erred on the side of uh, doing a more gentle introduction to some of these concepts. The little man and all of that was um, not exactly how I would do it in a more technical uh, class. And then the third thing that was different is uh, I actually don't use PowerPoint in a regular class. I use the document camera. And now that I see how this class went, I actually regret it a little bit because I think it, less to, it led to less interaction than I would have liked. So those are three things. Really interesting. Um, I should have started with a number of compliments. Um, no time like the present. So one thing I, I knew to expect was technology. That we were, like, you walk in, you have the clickers, you have all these different things set up. But something that was really nice was that the technology didn't interrupt personal engagement. So from the way that you walked, you made eye contact, there was lots of good humor. At some point, we stopped and we talked to each other. Um, one thing that I didn't include in, in the introduction uh, is that Dan has been co-chair of the Harvard X Research Committee, of which I am a part, and Andrew is also a part. And when you were chairing, one thing that was clear was, all right, we've been sitting too long. All right. Small groups have discussion. So even committee meetings, he runs as if he's teaching with lots of engagement. So the technology, while it was there, didn't get in the way of personal interactions. But I'm kind of curious, and you said this uh, uh, on the side you know, um, for a moment. I actually touched base with May and with, with Teddy during the break. When do you decide to use the technology versus not? When, Because sometimes I know I worry about it being too much of a bell or a whistle or a distraction. Um, versus really pushing the content. So when do you decide to use it? And I even, I look back at Mandy and said, do you guys have backup plans if the technology fails? And she mm -hmm. kind of pulled out, but I'll let you answer that question. <laughs> um, 
so the first thing I would say is that I um, I'm not a techie myself, and um, the people who give me the courage to try technology are standing here, and uh, Josh as well ha has has uh, done some of that. I I mean I think to keep the answer simple, I try to think very hard: is it really advancing the learning of the uh, students? And you know, to just to give a very concrete example, I've had a lot of debates and struggles with. Uh, these devices, because on the one hand they're wonderful uh, as a way of pulling the class uh, very quickly. On the other hand, with modern technology, laptops, and they are much more sophisticated ways of polling, not only for A, B, C, D, but other kinds of polls. But I've I've tried some of those, and I've seen what happens. Um, all the computer screens are up, and uh, I don't have, as I told Karen when she gave one of her classes, I don't have um, that compelling way of teaching that everyone is going to say, I'm going to have the computer in me with me and do something uh, uh, related to the class only. And so I try to weigh the benefits and costs in terms of uh, learning, and we do have backup uh, plans, may have uh, little sheets of paper where you would have filled in uh, the birthday by hand. And we would have, well, they would have put all the papers together, and we would have done it. In the in the regular classes, I think my students can attest. I got the birthday data from the administrator of the program, so that wasn't even necessary. Um, that piece of technology wasn't necessary. Okay. Well, for those of us who have taught, I think one thing that's really hard. I know you've taught this class multiple years, and you can talk. You've talked a bit about how classes evolved. I'm curious, what was version 1.0 like, and then how has the class changed over time? So if I had to summarize uh, version 1.0 in one word, I would say disaster. Uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a very humbling experience. Uh, it was an experience where I learned a lot. And one of the things uh, that happened in that experience is that I was coming to the Kennedy School as a visitor. And even though I asked the question many times, so what are the students like and all of that, um, I, I misjudged where they were, uh, and by class number eight, it was just too late to to do much, um, and so I I I struggled quite a bit uh, in that first teaching experience, and um, I sort of did a lot of reflections on what to change for the next year. The next year it went a little bit better, uh, and then the following year a little bit better, and I would like to think that things have gone uh, better since then. But uh, understanding who your students are and what their background is and how they're coming to the class is crucial. And I think that sometimes is very hard to do before you actually teach the class. Yeah, I agree. So one thing I mentioned when I introduced you is that you're the faculty director of Slate. And yeah. so could you talk a little bit about that and what kind of resources and yeah. supports they give you and your students? Well, there are a lot of people from Slate here. So let me mention them bri briefly. Maria, uh, and if I forget someone, please let me know Maria. Erin, uh, Patricia, Laura, um, May, am I missing someone? Uh, all of them are, oh, sorry, one more. <laughs> <laughs> Allison. Uh, so uh, they are a wonderful team of people who basically uh, advance the learning of the, of the institution. Uh, in various ways, from producing curriculum, uh, from coaching people, from uh, allowing people to um, um, be better at technology, uh, be better at teaching in general, conducting workshops. So we do a series of activities. We have a website that's being developed at the moment where we're going to post a lot of uh, that. But you know, our mission is to help faculty become more effective teachers. Um, and that's what we try to do day in and day out. Well, I don't want to monopolize the question question time. So, are there other questions you guys have? Andrew has one. <coughs> okay, go ahead. So, one of the major accomplishments I think of Slate is that you uh, you initiated I think a, a pretest um, uh, option where you measure the sort of baseline knowledge of, of, of students. And yeah. That you know what is, you feel like we should all do that to try to understand where our students are coming from and where we get them. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you, but it's, I, I don't do it. <laughs> Even though I think it's a great idea. Can you talk about um, how valuable that's been? Whether it's worth it, and sure. if it's worth it, how to get teachers like me over the activation, you yeah. know, energy kind of curve to to get there. So. Um, 
thank you for the question. Uh, the person who deserves all the credit for this is actually one of your professors, Dick Light, who we have the fortune to spend some time with us at the Kennedy School and at Slade in particular. Um, I would say, ideally, we should all be doing uh, this. In practice, there are barriers to sort of doing pre-test on students and, and, and then uh, post-test. I sort of volunteered myself to be one of Dick's uh, data points at uh, one semester. It was extremely helpful to know what were the kinds of questions where my students were doing better, what were the kinds of questions where they were doing uh, worse. Uh, but there are certainly challenges in implementing this, and in fact, one of Dick's major accomplishments is that we did a pretest for the whole MPP program, not just like one course, but we asked uh, students on a sort of a wide-ranging set of questions, uh, what they knew at the beginning and what they knew at the end. And Dick is actually writing up uh, some of the lessons learned, not, not so much from this experience, but from doing this. Mm -hmm. So I think by April 29, <laughs> I don't want to put him on the spot, but there might be a document to share uh, with all the lessons learned and the challenges of doing this kind of work. If I could add uh, or build on that question, How, you know, what, is, what parts from this lecture do you think translate to other types of courses, say, yeah. their literature, or if you're teaching a policy class, how is it different than yeah. a probability class? Class. So, so obviously here, you know, the two questions that I posed had a right answer, and so it was uh, in some way the clickers worked as a measure of, all right, where are they with respect to this? I, in terms of the technology at least, I think um, uh, to me what the technology is allowing us to do, and whether you do it with clickers or you do it with anything else, is, is getting you to think uh, about the question and engage and put your stake on the question before uh, you engage in the learning. You know, I could have started the class by telling you the 20 experiments conducted in the last five years where people's intuitions have been wrong, and then you would have been, oh, all right, fine. And so hopefully today you, you saw that for yourselves, at least 71% of you did. Um, <laughs> I suspect that Joe also saw it for himself, even though he did the correct answer. Uh, um, and, um, and so I think the experience becomes a little bit more, um, you're, you're engaging your, your knowledge and your preconceptions before you begin. And I, think, I, I sort of think that that's fundamental uh, to anything we do, whether we do it with clickers or not. The one thing I would um, say about whatever method you use is that um, I think knowing where the students are is very, very important. And sometimes we use methods that are not exactly useful uh, in trying to assess that. And I'll, I'll sort of give you my, my first uh, sort of uh, aha moment with the clickers. Uh, I was teaching a class. There were 15 minutes left. I was running late. I had a clicker question, and I said to myself, I just don't have time for this. But it was a warm-up question. I said, you know, fine, they'll get it right. Let me do it quickly. And uh, I thought 80% of people would get it right. And then when we went back, um, it was not even close. In fact, it was, I think, one of my few moments in teaching where for one minute I just could not talk. I had no idea of where to go at that moment. And then after that minute? <laughs> after, after that minute, it was incredibly valuable because after that minute, I saw that the, the top answer didn't have 80%, had 44%, but uh, it wasn't even the right answer. But I knew at least what was the main misconception that the students had, and we had a conversation that I thought led to more learning than if I had just done what I would have done typically, which is had them discuss, and then one student raised their hand, and then they come, and they maybe they give us their answer. I would have never learned that 83% of the students had no idea of the question to begin with. Uh, and I, th I, I think that's valuable. Um, that's incredibly valuable. It, it showed me how wrong my own intuition was about where my students were, um, and that's sort of why I have adopted some of this. I was taking notes throughout, and that was actually a nice thing you did, that when you know, the majority of people got it wrong. You didn't just say, okay, that's the right answer, let's move on. Yeah. But you really stopped and kind of broke apart, well, why? And, yeah. and it was in a non-threatening, using humor and, and so forth, to really examine, well, why, why people got the intuition wrong. Yeah. So. yeah. Thank you.
Other questions? Joe. <clears throat> just wanted to, uh, I guess the, the question that I always wrestle with with technology is does efficient teaching translate into effective learning? Yeah. And one of the things I just, it was a small example you gave, but I, I want to use it as kind of a, a mini case yeah. Yeah. to explore that a little bit. When you said, well, if this was like one of my real classes, I would have checked with the program administrator to find out when everybody's birthdays yeah, were. Yeah. So I would, I could cut to the chase yeah. on that. I wouldn't yeah. need to waste the time or yeah. take the time yeah. to collect that raw data yeah. from the class. Yeah. That's more efficient. Yeah. But I, part of me wonders, is it more engaging if the students generate the raw data mm -hmm. in the moment right. so that it, it the, when you get to the pedagogical point, yeah. it, it's potentially more powerful because it wasn't some efficiently set up situation. It was something that they actually kind of conspired in a good way to create the, the learning yeah. moment. So to me, technology can be efficient, yeah. but maybe in ways that don't you know, produce that more of an aha moment potential for yeah. students. Yeah. I totally agree with your broad uh, point about the efficiency versus uh, efficiency of teaching versus effectiveness and learning. On, on this uh, particular uh, point, uh, you know, knowing the student's birthday is th that activity in which we spend two minutes. Um, maybe it wasn't that costly, but I don't think there was too much learning uh, going on. Maybe it was more powerful for you to have fill in um, the thing, but w w what I did at the end, which is all right, stand up if you were born on June 7th, was, to meant, was meant to illustrate that aha moment. Um, and it wasn't so much a data collection, it was that. And, and that you could have say, well, why did you waste your time with that? Just show the table or just do the calculations and that's it. And there, I sort of err on the side of going uh, further. But I think your general point, I, I totally agree. Uh, efficiency in teaching doesn't, well, efficiency in teaching doesn't translate into effectiveness in learning. And more fundamentally, teaching doesn't translate into learning <laughs> anyway, uh, unless you sort of think carefully about uh, what's happening. But I, I don't know, they're, they're, they're former students of mine here. So if they want to jump in, they can, they can tell you the answer to your question. Now. Michelle? I would like to have you talk a little more about the document camera and how you use that in your or in your class. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you, you, you had a handout here. And in a typical class, I give students a handout with uh, blank spaces where we together um, would answer the questions. And so just like I was doing with a calendar there, except that now they had that blank space in the handout and we would together uh, fill it in. And uh, this goes to your point, efficiency uh, in teaching versus effectiveness in learning. I think the document camera is actually not very efficient in the sense that, you know, there are pieces of paper flying in and out and all of that. But I, I do think for me, I'm not suggesting that everyone, I do think that it, it, it gives a little bit more flexibility in terms of reacting to what's going on in the classroom. The, the, the PowerPoint, I feel, for me, boxes me in, in a way that I don't find very helpful. And so what I typically do in a class is I would have the document camera for, I would say, 80% of the things that we do. And then the, the PowerPoint is mainly for the clicker questions, or in this case, you know, the illustration of the, so this is another question about the use of technology. I think that illustration, uh, which is totally due to May, with a little thousand little men, I don't know how useful it was to you, but yeah. that, I, I sort of feel like that illustration uh, is where technology was helpful as opposed to if I had tried to do that in the document camera. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Dan, two practical questions. The first one is uh, about time management of class. How do you calibrate the amount of time that you are going to spend. Um, for instance, when you are running kind of late or that yeah. you are spending a lot of time, what do you do in the last 10 minutes? How, how yeah. do you calibrate the time? 
that's the first question. The second question is, what do you do to make your students prepare before class? What What are the techniques that you say, okay, these people are going to come to class yeah. to absorb whatever yeah. I... Yeah. Okay, on the time management issue, to the extent that you think we can learn from failure, I'll be glad to share my experience. <laughs> uh, but I'm not, I'm not too good. This is an issue that I struggle with a lot. But I do have two pieces of advice uh, that might be helpful. One, um, in, uh, in, in, in May even did this today. For, for every class, I ask a course assistant or someone to record how, in, in my case, in the handout, to record how much time each segment of the class took. And so that when the following year I'm going to teach that class, I have no delusions of how much I'm going to do because I'm like, oh yeah, I can do this in five minutes. Wait a second, last year it took 15. So how is it that you're going to do it? So that's a disciplining device. Of course, you know, the structure of the class changes and all of that. That's a disciplining device that I use. In terms of how do you manage when there are 10 minutes left, uh, what I try to do, as I said at the beginning, in designing a course, but also in designing a class, is think about all right, in particular in designing a class, what are the one or two things that I absolutely want the students to be able to gain from this experience? Um, and then that, I think, helps me make the cuts. So I think carefully about, all right, if I'm running out of time, which parts would I cut? But I'm far from being good at this. I'm just sharing two things that have helped me be better uh, at it. On the second, how do you get students to prepare for class? Um, there are students here, so I'll let them answer if they want. There are problem sets every week. Uh, the problem sets include online uh, assessment, uh, online modules that they get to engage with and are part of the assignments. But I don't know. The few of you are here. I don't know if you want to say anything. Maybe they'll tell me the truth and <laughs> don't prepare for class. <laughs> hey, could you elaborate what you mean by online modules? Yes, yeah, so online modules are, um, and, and you know, Teddy, May, and, and Josh have contributed greatly uh, to this, but these are uh, interactive, typically 10 to 10, 15 minutes uh, online experience. They click on a link and then they go uh, through the experience in which uh, some concepts might get explained, but then there are lots of questions uh, about the content. And then I get all the data from the answers to that question before class and then uh, adapt or modify the class plan according to that um, data. And so that uh, those online assessment helps both getting data about the students, but it also helps make sure that everyone has some common base to begin with. Joe. Yeah, is there, is there any, is it possible to generalize about what happens when you pose the problem, people answer, and then you do the conferring? Yeah. It, that the crowdsourcing converges on better answers, or is it, is it possible to generalize that? Not always, and this is a, a, you know, one of the many things I've learned from Eric Mazur in his uh, use of uh, clickers. Uh, he has done some research to understand what happens in those groups. I do it a lot more informally by just circulating around. Today, if you look at what happened, the, literally the percent of I don't know went up. Uh, and that to me was a sign, like if this were an actual class, that to me would have been a sign, uh, going back to Felipe's question, all right, you know, whatever plans I have, they have to be modified <laughs> at the moment. Uh, and so, um, and so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know uh, if I would have been able to do differently, um, you know, with this, with this, um, uh, plan that I had uh, here today. Uh, what I would say is if, if the if the clickers tend to the right answer, we might conclude, oh, the students have learned. And I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure because Pei Pei seems to have been convinced by Terry. And really convinced. Like she gave an explanation that at least leads me to believe that there was learning occurring in that interaction. Mm -hmm. But uh, another person sitting next to Terry 
Like this guy's a professor of statistics at Harvard. We must know better. And I, you would change your vote and not really change your understanding. And so I've done a little bit of exploration asking students, all right, did you change your mind and how? And this is why I asked the question, who changed their mind and why, to try to get at that, to try to get at was, was there really an increase in understanding or was it more like, all right, this person always has the right answer and I just haven't changed? So, thank you. Fernando. I, I have a comment on it first. That's one thing you did very well is that you were obviously prepared. This was a special occasion for you. You dressed. You took the time to plan activities. You took the time to pause and see what we're doing. And what I think what that activates is engagement. Mm -hmm. I see this guy cares so much about what he's teaching mm -hmm. and about me that I want to engage with this subject matter. And when I, when I think about teaching, it seems to me we're trying to do three things that are related but not the same. One is to promote understanding, which you can do with explanations and so on. The other one is to promote engagement, motivation, which is just as important or more important because my own theory is that most learning is actually going to happen out of the classroom yeah. if we succeed at motivating them. That's when they do the P sets, the homework. That's when they go above and beyond because they say, I like this guy so much that I'm going to do my best work for him. <laughs> and the third piece is paying attention, which is difficult these days because there are so many distractions in these body laptops and, and in their cell phones and so on. And my question to you is, when you plan your class, do you intentionally have an algorithm to say how much of what I'm going to do is because I really want to engage them? And it may not really help someone clarify, yeah. but it's good. It's part of the theater. This is a performance activity. And when you perform, you pay attention. You plan it. Yeah. Or does it come to you naturally because you're just a caring person and a nice guy? You know, is this part of it? Is this part of your planning? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I did dress different today. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a very interesting uh, comment. Um, I think one thing that has changed in my approach to teaching over the last ten years uh, is is precisely what you said before, which is uh, I I used to think a lot about what I was doing in the classroom. Um, and then that, of course, changed into, all right, well, what's really relevant is what my students are doing in the classroom. And now I pay a lot more attention to what the students do outside of the classroom, because the reality is, you know, it's 80 minutes twice a week during. And so, so I do think very intentionally about their learning, not just in the, in the classroom. Um, and that, that leads to some decisions that I make in, in the classroom. So, for example, I probably uh, cover less material than if I were obsessed with, all right, they need to know X, Y, and Z. Uh, because I know that, you know, if I do that, I might have the illusion that they have learned more, but, you know, what happens outside the classroom and all of that wouldn't be affected. I think uh, there's a book called Teaching as Performance that Alison once uh, gave me to read. I'm, I'm an introvert by nature, so for me to think of teaching as a performance is terrifying. Uh, and so I, I, I like to think in terms of their engagement, uh, but I'm, I'm very, very uh, nervous about thinking of this as, you know, it's like a concert. Uh, I will say that a lot of it might resemble a performance. I mean, the, the birthday puzzle, part of it was building the drama of, wait a second, why did I get it wrong? So in that sense, yes, um, it, it, it kind of is. But I, I mean, you know this much better than I do, Fernando. It really is not about me. Uh, it, it's about the learners. That's as simple as that. Any last question? Last question. Just um, sorry, there's okay. a student, and uh, they, oh, yeah. they should receive priority, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> sorry, Luis. <laughs> I, will have, I will dedicate personal attention to your question. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say that I think like, one of the like, most important things that we have is um, a teacher who is engaged. Because that's the only thing that we see, like the theoretical things that we see, they're 
always like focus on a topic that is meaningful for us. So I think like at the end, like right now that when we were doing like the um, like the mammogram thing, like we were trying together to remember the formula, but what we like really remember really good was like if your incidence is low, like then the probability is gonna be like lower. So like at the end, I think that something that was really important is that all the topics were focused on things that were like interesting to us. So I think we're always gonna remember everything that we learned based on, on the examples that we saw in class. And also about the engaging part. Like for example, uh, there was one time where we were seeing like contrafactuals, and he asked one of our like classmates, uh, like if he hadn't gone to university, what he has like what we had what he had been, and he said that he would be like a fireman. So like next class, he brought us a picture of Horacio dressed as a fireman. <laughs> so like I think that's something that is really important. That like we always thought that he really cared about us, and like he always tried to like take us into the class the discussion. So I, I think that's like two of the things that like we really appreciate. Of that. That is a wonderful note to end this, this wonderful presentation.